During this segment of our course, we will show you how to disassemble a typical Kingsbury-type thrust bearing. We will also clean all parts of the bearing and inspect each part for wear or damage. This centrifugal pump is equipped with a thrust bearing of the type we're talking about, so we will use it in our demonstration. However, since we are dealing with thrust bearings, we will not concern ourselves with the pump proper. The object of our concern is encased within this part of the pump, the thrust bearing housing. The workman assembles the tools and supplies which will be needed to perform the task at hand. A very important aspect of any activity, of course, is safety. Always use the proper safety apparel for the job. Don't be half safe. Take a little time out to clean the outside of the equipment before beginning the disassembly. Otherwise, loose scale or grit could fall into the housing and create problems that were not there before. Drain the old lubricating oil from the bearing housing and dispose of it. Since this pump is equipped with an external oil reservoir, the lubrication piping was disconnected and removed in the field so we are ready to begin disassembly. First, however, check to see if the mating parts are match marked. If they are not, mark them now. This could save some head scratching during reassembly. Now remove the bolts which secure the oil pump to the oil pump bracket and place them in a container for small parts. Then remove the oil pump from the oil pump bracket and place it aside. Loosen all of the bolts which secure the oil pump bracket to the bearing housing and remove those in the top half of the bracket. Loosening all of the bolts will make the task of lifting the top half of the bearing housing easier. We want to remove the top half of the bearing housing now, however. This deflector might prevent it from being lifted off, so loosen the deflector lock screws and move it back on the shaft far enough to clear the bearing housing. Now remove the bolts securing the top half of the bearing housing to the bottom half. There are two taper dowel pins, one on each side, which assure proper alignment of the bearing housing halves. They should be removed now, and in this instance, this may be accomplished by tapping them lightly on the lower end with a hammer. During reassembly, each pin should be installed in the same hole it was removed from. The top half of the bearing housing may now be lifted and placed aside. Care must be taken to lift the housing half straight up and level to prevent damage to the oil seal ring on the inboard end of the housing. The journal bearing does not enter into our discussion and will not be disturbed, so the workman is covering it with a clean cloth to protect it from contamination until the top half of the bearing housing can be replaced. The oil pump bracket is the next piece to be removed. So remove the bolts from the lower half of the bracket. Remember, we loosened these bolts earlier. Then remove the bracket by slipping it off the end of the thrust collar lock nut. This should be done with care to prevent damage to the outboard oil seal ring, which is mounted in the oil pump bracket. Once the oil pump bracket is removed, the oil pump coupling components are exposed and may be removed at this time. We will not go into detailed explanation of the oil pump or its coupling, since there are numerous arrangements employed by equipment manufacturers in their lubricating oil supply systems. Before starting the disassembly of the thrust bearing, 
Prepare an area to place the parts as they are removed from the housing. Clean cloth spread out like this will provide an excellent area for this purpose. Now we are ready to disassemble the thrust bearing. We will begin by removing the thrust shoes on the outboard side of the thrust collar. Remove the shoes which are on top. Then rotate the base ring to present more shoes for removal. Continue this until all of the shoes have been removed from this side of the thrust collar. Once all of the thrust shoes are removed, the two halves of the base ring are easily removed by rotating one half to the top, lifting it out, and then rotating the other half out. It's good practice to keep the bearing components separated and identified as to position. As you can see, these parts are labeled outboard. Even though the shoes in this particular thrust bearing are identical, and when new, they could be placed in any position in the bearing assembly. After they have been in service, a wear pattern will sometimes develop. In that situation, the shoes on one side of the collar may have slightly more wear, and it would not be practical to mix shoes from both sides of the thrust collar. As you may remember, some thrust bearings utilize shoes designed for rotation in only one direction. With a bearing of this type, it is important that the bearing components be identified as to location during disassembly. Using the same procedure, remove the thrust shoes and the base ring from the inboard side of the thrust collar and place them in the protected area. All of the parts disassembled thus far are stationary during operation of the equipment in which they are installed. The remainder of the thrust bearing components are attached to the shaft and rotate with it during operation. Before beginning disassembly of the rotating parts, provide yourself with a little insurance which might come in handy during reassembly. Scribe lines on the face of the thrust collar and the lock nut which coincide. This will enable you to tighten the lock nut to exactly the same position during reassembly and will greatly reduce the possibility of excess runout. Just be sure the line on the thrust collar does not extend to the thrust shoe bearing area. With the location lines properly scribed, begin the disassembly of the rotating parts by first loosening the set screw in the thrust collar lock nut. Now the lock nut may be loosened. This nut is pulled up tight during assembly and some force is required to loosen it. Sometimes it may be necessary to apply a sharp blow to the wrench with a hammer to initially break the joint between the collar and the lock nut. If this is necessary, be extra careful to prevent injury to yourself or damage to the equipment. Once the lock nut is loosened, unscrew it from the shaft and place it in the protected area. Any nicks or burrs on the face of the nut could cause unnecessary runout problems during reassembly. With the lock nut off, the thrust collar may now be removed from the shaft. Usually on bearings of this size, the thrust collar may simply be slipped off the shaft manually. On larger bearings, threaded holes are sometimes provided in the thrust collar to permit use of a puller in removing the collar from the shaft. Place the thrust collar in the protected area and be sure that nothing is placed on top of it which might scar the thrust shoe bearing surface or the surface which mates with either the lock nut or the shaft adjusting shim. A nick or burr in either of these areas will cause trouble during reassembly. Now remove the thrust collar drive key from the shaft and place it in the container. Then remove the shaft adjusting shim by slipping it off the shaft and place it in the protected area so that both its faces are protected. 
It is important that this shim be reinstalled in the same position, so observe which face mates with the shaft shoulder. That completes the disassembly of this thrust bearing assembly, with the exception of the inboard oil seal ring and the outboard oil seal ring, which is mounted in the oil pump bracket. If the clearance between the rings and their mating surfaces are within limits and there is no damage to them, it will not be necessary to remove them. We'll have more to say about them later. All of the bearing components should be cleaned thoroughly and inspected for wear or damage. Particular attention should be given to the thrust shoes and the thrust collar. For instance, the original scraper marks should be visible in the Babbitt face of the thrust shoes. If they are not visible, it may indicate a need for installing new shoes. If you are in doubt, ask your supervisor. By the same token, if a definite wear pattern is visible on the bearing surfaces of the thrust collar, it would indicate that there may be overloading, improper lubrication, or metal fragments embedded in the thrust shoe babbit surfaces. Again, if in doubt, ask your supervisor. Now we are back to the oil seal rings. The workman is measuring the inside diameter of the outboard ring here. Here he is measuring the outside diameter of the companion surface on the thrust collar lock nut. Now he is comparing the two measurements. The clearance on these rings should be from five ten thousandths to two thousandths of an inch per inch of diameter. In the event this ring is to be replaced, just remove the bearing adjusting shim by taking out these screws Remove the old ring and install a new one. Then secure it with the shim and screws. A thickness gauge may be utilized to determine the clearance of the inboard oil seal ring. The clearance limits are the same as the outboard ring. There is quite a different situation here if this ring needs to be changed. As you can see, there is no way to remove the ring unless the rotating assembly is removed from the pump or the lower half of the bearing housing is unbolted from the pump case and lowered enough to permit the ring to slide off the shaft. In this instance, the ring's clearance is well within limits, so we will proceed to the next step, which is to check the oil pump coupling for wear or damage. Rotate the oil pump shaft to check for free operation of the pump. That completes the disassembly of this thrust bearing. At this point, all repair work should be completed and all new replacement parts obtained. We'll be back to demonstrate the installation and adjustment procedure after you complete exercise number three in your workbook.